instead of doing it on their own without getting in touch. Okay. Um, so what sort of attention has the project really garnered so far? I know, obviously, the GitHub has 22,000 stars. Again, I don't know how it managed to get there without anyone telling me about the project, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say right now it is accurate to describe Graphite as a project that has largely flown under the radar of almost everyone. Um, and that's a blessing and a curse. Um, it actually has allowed us to kind of just let things cook. And that is in many ways good because we have really ambitious goals. And if we were sitting here telling you the intro, the you know, the first half hour of this podcast three years ago, mm -hmm. it would be a lot of hot air. Um, but we've built a sizable portion. You know, it's only 1% of the true grand vision, but mm -hmm. we've got another 99% to go, but hopefully we'll have a bigger team to get there faster. Um, but it really is helpful that we've been able to just sit there and kind of cook without people getting too angry at us that that the software has been crap this entire time. Um, at like only in the past year has it actually become at a performance level viable to use the editor for more than just testing. But now it's actually like performance is decent. Some people have even said it better than Inkscape. Some people have said it's a little worse than Inkscape. It's, you know, around the same level ish. And it will mm -hmm. continue to get a lot better because we have barely even touched the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more low hanging fruit to go, which means that it's even easier to continue making further improvements. And we are really building the architecture and the, the core technology here with the specific goal of allowing you to work with terabytes of data someday. <laughs> um, you know, it might take an hour per frame to render something of that size, but the point is to handle that kind of scale someday. Um, that is the performance goals that we have in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it should be the highest performance graphics editor available someday. <laughs> That's what we're building towards. Is there anything else you guys wanted to touch on? Or is that... We've sort of touched on a lot of stuff, but anything we didn't get to, anything we kind of missed? I mean... I think that's probably been a pretty good overview. We didn't talk quite about the compiler yet. Um, so well, the ability yeah. to basically create a piece of artwork as a program and then compile it to mm. an executable, like a standalone, completely standalone executable okay. that can either, for example, run as like a, the equivalent of a full screen game where you double click on, for if, you know, if it's on Windows, you double click on an EXE file or on Linux, you uh, open it however you open an, an executable that would launch full screen. Um, and it would, like run full screen, pro probably forever, unless maybe some there some way to execute. Sorry, to to terminate, uh, and it could, for example, be a game, or it could be a live visualization of music, or it could be um, maybe you have it running on some kind of interactive exhibit with a projector screen and a camera that's receiving your video mm -hmm. feed and like noticing where a person's walking by and creating like butterflies flying onto their yeah. shoulders or something with a projector projecting onto them. Um, so it could run full screen as a standalone program, just like in you know Unity it will comp or Godot or any you know any game engine compile a standalone program. It's not using the editor anymore. Mm. Um, it allows you to do the same thing where you are creating. In this case, it's basically a sequence of Rust functions because we build it in Rust, so all the actual operations, the graphics operations, are running in Rust. They get compiled together into a sequence, and they can become literally a Rust program. So Graphite can transpile your Graphene program. So Graphene is the, the, the language that describes your sequence of operations, mm -hmm. your sequence of nodes, into a like literally a Rust source code file. And then the Rust compiler can then compile that onto any platform as an executable. And it runs completely standalone without any connection to the original editor that it was built from. Mm -hmm. So that's a really cool use case that you can then have it. You know, you might compile a birthday card generator because you might run like some website that generates birthday cards for mm. people, and you can choose a template and choose a name, upload a photo, upload a birthday age, and make like greeting cards for people. And you run that on a server or compile it to WebAssembly, and it runs for your visitors' client side. Mm -hmm. And uh, disclaimer: this is not something that is currently built. Uh, we do have the infrastructure in place and like we prototyped it a little bit and um yeah we did something like that for like i've built uh, the basic flow and it's like the basic feature set but there is more work that needs to be put towards it because right. we at that point also need to have a runtime because again NodeGraph is functional and if you want this to be useful you need to have a runtime to accept inputs etc that's all of those are features we need to build, which are not like those don't necessarily interact with what we do in the editor. Mm -hmm. So it's extra thing, extra things we need to build. But 
in general, the idea is to get as close to, well, so, and this is also part of the bigger scheme. So as you mentioned, functions mm -hmm. like nodes, we have two kinds of nodes. Mm -hmm. We have sort of general, like abstractor, like we, we have nodes which can be made of smaller nodes. So you can encapsulate network, like node networks into node networks, yeah, so display them node as groups nodes. basically in the Blender and terminology. That's similar to in programming, how you would make a function that calls other functions as a way of abstracting features. So in the seven segment display example I mentioned earlier, you could make every segment just be its own node, which receives a number and then displays the number. So you could abstract the functionality. Similarly, we can, like, this is how nodes are, nodes are built. Nodes are either, either consist of other nodes, like a node network, or they are basically just Rust source code, or just a Rust function. And when you usually use the editor, we run, we run sort of an interpreter. So the graphite code is, we have these pre-compiled atomic functions, mm -hmm. call these the protonodes. They are very primitive, or at least relatively primitive. <laughs> and we then link them together at runtime to form one function we can call, which is sort of mm -hmm. the document you can run. And what we can do instead is that we, instead of linking pre-compiled nodes, is that we basically copy paste together the source code, just call the nodes in a sequence, and then allow the Rust compiler to compile it. And one of the great avenues this allows us to potentially delve into in the future is that we can do jitting. We can, mm -hmm. like if you have one branch of your node graph, which you rarely touch, but which is performance critical, we can ask Rust C to compile this section of the graph into a node. Uh -huh. And because it's purely functional, we know it's the same behavior. We can just do that and replace the function with this node and with this pre-compiled assembly. And that is something we can very relatively easily do on the desktop app, but is going to be a lot harder to do on desktop because on web. Uh, yes, sorry. But it's going to be harder to do on web because the WASM target group is like the WASM working group is just not far enough along. And um, yeah, it just, it's going to take more time until we can do that in the web. But mm. on desktop, we could do it right now, essentially. Okay. And basically, that allows you to optimize certain parts of your execution to be even faster because you get to utilize compiler optimizations, LLVM optimizations, um, and get that to run even faster, getting down to like bare metal kind of performance. Um, for some of your operations. And then ever if you go like modify some of those pieces, then we just fall back to using the individual like sequence of individual operations instead of the pre-compiled version until we wait until there's enough time to go by where we have time to run in the background a compiler that will recompile that area once you stop touching it. Mm -hmm. And that's also something that could be a future uh, additional part of our business model that basically anyone who wants someday to get a, like an even faster way to run their artwork, um, if they choose to, they could um, basically allow it to like stream the changes that they're making to their artwork to a server that we run mm. and make pre-compiled pieces of code to substitute in those blocks of, of execution mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. send those back to you, send you like compiled substitutions. And that could speed up your workflow, make it run faster. And just another way for people who want to, you know, if you don't want to be running that com computation locally, maybe you're on a Chromebook, maybe you're on the web version, maybe you're on an iPad, whatever that is, um, you could ultimately just have things run a little bit faster. And then not only the replacements, but also rendering. We could pre-render certain areas. Maybe you haven't scrolled down yet, but we predict that there's a reasonable chance you might scroll down or zoom out or play the animation. We could pre-render specific frames of your animation or pre-render an area beneath where you're going to scroll to. And if you choose to support us, basically, um, then we can provide you compute resources to pre-render that stuff, send it to you over the internet, um, and let that run. Or also we have the idea to, let's say you have a gaming computer in your basement, but right now you're just working on your iPad or something. Um, you could run it in your own local network, run like a headless version of Graphite, or maybe just keep Graphite open in the background. And because it's on your same network, you can use your own local compute resources to run that same kind of computation. Or a CI server on and, top of um, the wardrobe. Yeah, <laughs> right back there. Yeah. And the, um, so 
the way the graphing language is designed will be it should allow us to basically get zero cost abstractions. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, like we're not there yet, but we don't have when we have not painted ourselves into a corner. I was very made sure of that and much to keep in dismay, but we can still like we can generate code that is going to be compiled into something that's very similar to what you would write if you just wrote it yourself mm -hmm. and basically becomes nearly optimal because of like how we build the language and design choices which make a lot of things harder from time to time but we are we do always make sure that we don't limit our performance seeding essentially mm -hmm. that we can always eliminate all the overheads even if that makes if that means mm -hmm. We have to think a lot harder about how we do things. Mm -hmm. And there's one other thing we haven't talked about, which okay. is also a planned feature. Uh, we can just quickly mention it is collaborative editing. Yeah. That is Ooh. also something we want to support. So we do have some design ideas for how we can do the contract resolution, but essentially like live editing together, like multiplayer editing. Like Google Docs or Figma style. Right, right. Yeah. And also potentially like if two artists work on the same document, make different changes, how we that's a question of how we can merge them together, mm -hmm. ideally with our users having to resolve merge conflicts. Especially if two of them happen at this at different times uh, simultaneously, like without a network connection between them. So it's yeah. not live, it's mm -hmm. offline. Um, you can combine those together with um, like basically we're looking into CRDTs as the approach to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there, like, and if you ask, there's a list of things and potential features we could talk about. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned in the beginning, we are very ambitious as a project, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think we uh, do at some point have to um, <laughs> stop because the video is going to be very long otherwise. <laughs> no, I am... Yeah. Uh, I I am really excited to see where this project goes. Both of you, I, I know you said that Kivon's kind of the visionary here, but both of you are clearly like very excited about this project and have a lot of ideas for what you can do with it. I really hope that five years from now, I'm not making a WordPress style video about this project. <laughs> so hopefully yep. you guys keep doing really cool stuff going forward. And this really can be like, you know, the blender of 2D graphics, the OBS, the Godot, you know, any any of these tools which are industry standard tools, even if, like you were saying, this doesn't replace Photoshop, but becomes something in that pipeline. You're not trying that. to do everything Photoshop is doing. You're trying to fit within the pipeline and provide a reason for it to exist. 